Don't know how, so don't ask. But here's seven more affinity designer things that you probably didn't know about. If you haven't seen the other ones, make sure you check them. I'll link them up at the top here and also in the description below. I think this is the fourth one in this series, so make sure you check those out. All right, so first off, we've got artboard shapes. And a big thanks to Jim Dart for this one. So here we have an artboard. Now, if you check out the video about artboards, which I'll link up at the top as well, we can change the shape of this artboard. But something that we didn't come across is if we select this artboard, just by selecting the name at the top here, we can actually convert this to curves, which means we can now actually make this artboard into any shape we like using the handles like we normally would do if this was a shape. So we could make something like this and then actually start drawing in our design and it would be left with that artboard. So if we were to export this, it would export like that. So really handy to know if you ever need to make an artboard that isn't going to be square or rectangle. All right, we started off easy and here's number two, which is rubber band mode. So I'm all about making life easy. If we head over to the pen tool, sometimes when you're using the pen tool, it's hard to gauge where your next point should be. So if we wanted to make this into like an oval shape here, it'd be hard to really gauge where we should put our next point. Maybe we should put it here and curve it this much. Not quite good. And then you're constantly undoing and redoing over and over again. Instead, if you head up to the toolbar at the top here, we've got rubber band mode. If we select this, now our mouse pointer will create a line and it will give you a guide of where that line would be once we click. So actually we want to put it all the way over here. Once we click, it shows that line is complete. And then as we move, I'm not clicking anything here. Our mouse pointer follows that line. We can click and drag. And then again, you can see it's following my pointer. So it gives a good guideline, especially if we were gonna practice with the pen tool to get an idea of where we need to put our points to make them look as good as we want. I don't know why I'm making a spiral, but we're going with it. All right, we're rolling with these easy ones. We're on to number three already, which is text spacing. Now this is for all you text lovers out there. When you're creating text, a lot of times you might want to change the distance between the actual letters. So by selecting this text box, usually you would head over to the character panel and start messing around with these positioning and transform. However, if we really wanted to only select two different letters and affect the spacing between them, all we really need to do is select in between those letters, hold Alt and use the arrow keys left and right and we can affect just the spacing between those letters. So I'm pressing right, I'm pressing left, and then again, if we head over to here, hold Alt, we can change the spacing. Holding Alt, we can change the spacing. So just like that, really easily, I've made the adjustments that I wanted to make on that text without messing around in the positioning and transform panel. So just as easily, I can make this side bigger and make this one smaller to fit exactly the design I want just like that okay we're on to number four which is the noise slider now how many of you be honest how many of you knew there was this noise slider within affinity designer if you didn't I'll show you exactly where it is if we head over to this top right panel here in the color panel you can see it says opacity down at the bottom now this slider we're currently selecting this rectangle if we bring the slider down we're affecting the opacity of this rectangle simple However, if we click on this circle here, which if you highlight it, it says switch to noise. If you click it, you now have the noise slider. So if we pay attention to this rectangle now, if we increase this, you can actually see, I might zoom into that. You can actually see the noise within that shape. Now, if you can't see it, you've, you've just got to take my word for it, try it out yourself. But you can increase the noise, decrease the noise. So you can add an extra little effect to things just as easily. And then if we want to switch back, we just click that dot again and now we can affect the opacity again click back change the noise and we can go back and forth just like that now number five is related to colors as well and it's the secret color swatches so in the color panel over here if we select ourselves a color if we now head over to the hamburger menu up here and then go down to add cord to swatch we can now choose something which works well with that color so we've picked a greenish bluish color if we want the complementary to that color which is the opposite of the color wheel we would click complementary so if we click that now and head over to swatches you can see we've got our green and we've got the complementary color which is directly opposite in the color wheel and to prove that 
if we take this swatches panel out, you can see we've got the green here. When I select the red, it's directly opposite in the color wheel. So we've got complementary colors just like that without having to really think about anything. Similarly, if we've got this red one, let's say we go back up, add core to swatch. Let's choose something triadic. And if you want to learn about color theory, make sure you do look into that because it makes these make a little bit more sense. If we go to triadic, we now have the three colors in that triad, which is the red, the green, and the blue, which if you really look at this color panel, you can see it creates a triangle of where those three colors are. So it creates a harmonious color palette. So without having to really work out anything or try to figure it out yourself, you can just as easily create a color palette without much effort at all. Okay, moving on to number six, which is saving history with your document. So down in the panel here, we've got our history, which we've been doing a lot of different things so far today. Now, when we save our document and close it and reopen the document, all of this history disappears completely. Now, Affinity Designer is really good because you can go back very, very far in the history. And not only that, but you can actually set how far you can go. So you can even make it even bigger than that. But the problem is, is that once you've closed the document, that history is gone. However, if you head over to file and down to save history with document, it'll give you a pop up saying that saving history with document will mean that anybody who receives the document will be able to see everything that you did create. Are you sure? Let's hit yes. Now what that means is that once we save this document, the history will be saved with it. So it's really handy with super complicated designs where you may not look at it for days, weeks, months, or even years. You go back into it and you try to figure out what exactly you were doing. And with that history, it's a lot easier to understand what exactly you did. You can see all the different effects that you tried, all the different fill colors. But just so you know, anyone you send this file to will also be able to see the history in Affinity Designer. So whether that's a good thing for you or a bad thing, it's just something to be aware of. But if we try that now, so we have our document here, go to save, and we're just gonna call it untitled, and then we'll close the document down and then open it back up. So head over to the untitled one, open it up, and you can see we've got our design right here, and we've also still got our whole history. And just to confirm, if we head over to file, you can see that save history with document is selected. So that means now every time we save this file, it will also save the history. It will make your file size slightly bigger as well but only slightly. All right, and lastly today with number seven, we've got compound shapes. Now I am gonna make a video about this separately because it's a whole nother thing, but just to go through it pretty quickly, let's say you wanna combine these three shapes. So we would select these shapes and then usually head over to these Boolean tools to either add, subtract, intersect, XOR, or divide which splits them all into different shapes. But that is quite destructive. And generally in design, you wanna keep things as non-destructive as possible, meaning that you can always change things over and over again. So for example, if we hit add to this and then realize actually we wanted the circle a little bit more over to the right and this more over to the left, we'd have to undo, select the circle, move it over, select this cloud thingy, move it over, then select them all again, then hit add and then try to make the design work. But that's not really possible when we've made six or 700 steps and then we have to go and undo everything just to get this right. Instead, this is where compound shapes comes in. If we undo that, if we select all of these shapes and you can either hold Alt and click the add button and you can see down in the layer panel here, you can see it's all been compiled into a compound or you can head over to layer, create compound. Both will do the exact same thing. So now if we open this compound layer up here, you can see we've got our rectangle, our circle and our cloud. And you can also see the Boolean tool effect on the side as well. So right now what this is saying is that the rectangle is at the bottom and then we add the circle to it and then we add the cloud to it. Just as easily, we could select this cloud and change this Boolean to subtract. So now we've added the circle, but we've subtracted the cloud and we've got that shape. Now, if we think the same thing and actually we want to move these around, it's very simple now. We select the circle and we can move this, but it stays added to our rectangle. Similar, we can grab this cloud. We can intersect it from the center instead. So we can make these changes a lot easier because we have this compound shape and therefore it's non-destructive because we could easily just take these out with this compound shape and go back to exactly how we were and we can also edit on top of this and also if we wanted to change this one 
We can make that subtract as well, or we could make that one intersect. So right now we're intersecting the circle with the rectangle, and then we are subtracting the cloud from the circle. And that's what we're left with. But we can re-edit this over and over again as many times as we want. It makes it very highly editable, and that's the key. There you go, seven more Affinity Designer things that you probably didn't know about. Like I said, if you've not seen the other ones, make sure you check out the description below. I'll leave the playlist in there. How I keep coming across these, I have no idea. So like I said, don't ask. But if you come across anything interesting, make sure you drop it in the comments below and you might be featured in the next video. If you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe for more videos like this. And as always, I've been Brown Bear. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. How am I going to find seven more things for the next video? Hmm. Interesting. What if...